media liaison officer will, will tell you more about the topics and speakers later. Let me welcome all of you, but especially to the young people who after the lecture will be reading their essays. Now these are three young people out of a thousand who have written essays on racism and their views of what needs to be done about it. We honor them today. They receive some prizes. They will come forward to read the essays as well. And at the end of today, we will also acknowledge and thank an individual who has taken up and taken a stand against racism um, and, and made it an issue and forced it to be dealt with. And we do this annually in terms of recognizing a, a champion in the fight against racism, and we will talk more about that individual later on. So that, that's really the kind of program today um, that, that we'll be going through. We want to start with, however, acknowledging that uh, um, former president, deputy president, Kalman Motlante was meant to have been here. He might still be coming in um, at some point. Um, we, we, we will be expecting him here, as well as I think George Bezos will join us at some point soon. But to the board members of the foundation, other struggle stalwarts who are here, uh, we, we, we really acknowledge you and appreciate your presence here and support today. But more than anything else, all of you are welcome. Um, this is the 10th anniversary of the Kathrada Foundation. I'm going to do a long story about 10 years. We're just going to show you a little clip that captures our work over the last 10 years. Um, and thereafter we get into the formalities of the lecture. dozens of pieces. Part of this has been our Lives of Courage project that has produced many so they can learn from our past. Racism is a scourge that has continued to plague our country post-apartheid, and the Amal Katrada Foundation has played a leading role in combating it. 
The foundation has maintained two roles in combating racism. The first is calling out, intervening, and resolving racist incidents. We have done this in a decisive manner. With malicious acts, we have made certain charges were brought against the offenders and shown a spotlight on the process to hold them accountable. We have advocated for harsh and effective measures to curb overt racism. We have considered rehabilitative processes, including facilitation and mass awareness. Our responses have always been designed with the ultimate goal eradicating racism, bridging divides, and building social cohesion. We have also engaged with various sectors of society to implement policies that work to address systemic racism, which continues to entrench inequality in society. And we aren't slowing down. The Foundation is a founding member of the Anti-Racism Network of South Africa, which hosts an annual Anti-Racism Week. In addition, we are in the final test stage of a racism reporting app, which was piloted during Anti-Racism Week this year. We have also been involved in the process of developing the National Action Plan to combat racism. Uncle Kathy's life was dedicated to fighting injustice, and this is a central part of the legacy the Katrada Foundation is continuing. While our primary mandate is fighting racism, we have not backed down from other social justice fights. In particular, we have supported the Palestinian cause for liberation against apartheid Israel. As part of this work, on Robben Island in 2013, we launched the Global Free Marwan Bahuti and All Palestinian Political Prisoners Campaign. Together with a range of solidarity organizations, we have also participated in various vigils, a solidarity fast, and demonstration in support of the Palestinian liberation struggle. Under the guidance of Uncle Kathy, the Foundation also took an active role in fighting state capture. Uncle Kathy led the way for us when he wrote his open letter to then President Jacob Zuma. Uncle Kathy inspired many activists to come out and stand against corrupt presidents. He showed all of us that we owe our loyalty first and foremost to the Constitution and our country and only thereafter to our political homes. And even in his passing, his work was not finished. During his funeral and memorials, his memory and principles acted as a rallying cry for activists around the country to stand up and expand the fight against state capture. Together with Save South Africa, the Foundation hosted the Conference for the Future of South Africa and in turn founded the Future of South Africa organization. Through this organization, the Foundation has played a pivotal role in fighting state capture and is playing an ongoing role and changing constitutionalism. The youth are the future, and with this in mind, the Foundation has placed a growing focus on our youth work. Our youth work began in earnest in 2011 with the Youth Festival we hosted. This event brought together more than 5,000 youth from across Johannesburg. Following this event and realizing the need for activism, development and involvement in this space, the Foundation launched its early youth leadership programs. Over the years, we have held a variety of camps, some of which have happened on Robben Island, at which the youth learn about liberation history, how to be activists and socially just citizens. Youth have also been actively involved in many of our annual social responsibility initiatives, such as the Winter War. In the last winter home we organized, more than 300 people partook, collecting, sorting, and distributing the clothing that was collected. Workshops have been a growing part of our youth development in the foundation. An example of this was earlier this year when we held the launch of our new activism workbook based on the life of Uncle Kathy. Going forward, the foundation is greatly expanding our youth work with our first community youth clubs opening next year. These youth clubs will be bringing together groups of young people 
developing them and providing infrastructure for them to become activists and agents of non-racialism in our communities. By 2029, Uncle Cathy's centenary year, as part of our centenary project, we plan to have opened a hundred of these youth clubs all across the country. Through this ongoing work, the foundation will be keeping the legacy of Uncle Cathy alive by training the next generation of Right, and we didn't even have to ask for the applause. Thank you very much. Um, it's it's our it's just a huge honor to ask our two speakers to come to the stage. Um, Judith, Lindy, but you can, can be busy as well. And now for a huge round of applause to our speaker and the respondent. But also for the person who's going to be managing this, this part of the program. Now this is a young man that came into the foundation as an intern, um, having worked at above our offices at the community radio station, came into volunteer, became an intern. Today I think he is one of the best me media liaison people in the country. If you want to get media anywhere, Delani is the kind of person who can get this job done. Delani, please come forward and handle this part of the program. Um, thank you. Um, who needs a CV when you have a boss like that? Uh, so thank you very much for the privilege of introducing our topic, Fixing South Africa and the phenomenal guest speakers, Judith February and Lindy Wemasibubo, who will today lead us into a discussion that explores what is broken in post-apartheid South Africa. Over the last eight years, the Ahmed Katrada Foundation annual lecture series has probed key thinkers who have led public conversations on issues of nation building, social cohesion, to help us Judith February, who has also worked extensively on issues of good governance, transparency, and accountability within the South African context. Of the book, Turning and Cities of South Africa's Democracy. Responding to the lecture, we are joined by Lindy Wimazibugo, a public leader, writer, and academic fellow. A former parliamentary leader, Mazibugo is also the co-founder and executive director of A Political Academy, a non-partisan movement that aims to diversify public sector leadership around the country. It gives me great pleasure to call on Judith February, who will expand more on issues of accountability, a state of brokenness, and to raise our consciousness on who must do what. Director of the Foundation, Nishan Bolton, stalwarts, Lindiwe Mazabuko, and honored guests. Thank you very much. It really is a privilege for me to be delivering this lecture today to honor the legacy of Ahmed Katrada, a hero and an icon of the anti apartheid struggle, a man of principle who was deeply committed to constitutionalism and the rule of law, and to whom we remain grateful today. He died as he lived by championing the noble cause for which he was imprisoned. 
The work at the Foundation, as we've seen in the brief video, remains critical at this time, particularly espousing the principles of non-racialism and creating networks of international solidarity on human rights. The people universities is specifically important, as is its research on transformation and historical context, in order to inform policy making and its commitment to dialogue as a means of dealing with our challenges, I would say is timely. So the title of today's lecture is Fixing South Africa, What Needs to Be Done. So this is quite a daunting title, given where we find ourselves, but also given that I have 45 minutes. Um, I might just go um, slightly over that, because Lindy says she needs the time to uh, uh, figure out her thoughts on responding, although I'm sure she'll be completely fine. Last year, I was privileged to act as the respondent to Minister Praveen Gordon when he delivered his powerful lecture here. Then the rage against state capture was probably at its highest level, and there was a feeling in our country that we had completely lost our way. How would we ever make our way back? We're obviously not out of the woods yet, and um, Nishan has talked about the VBS bank scandal this past week and various other events. But a lot of the past year, President's most important tasks are ridding our institutions of corruption and trying to fix the economy. These are, this is desperate and difficult work. State capture, after all, has consequences, and we will talk more about those later. But given where we find ourselves, sometimes it's hard to be careful. And sometimes before. examining our current reality. It was in 54 BC when the Roman orator and lawyer Cicero lamented the state of the Republic. He says in De Republica, but though the Republic, when it came to us, was like a beautiful painting, whose colors, however, were already fading with age, our own time has not only neglected to freshen it by renewing the original colors, but has not even taken the trouble to preserve its configuration and, so to speak, its general outlines. Writing between 54 and 51 BC, De Republica was part lament for the state of the Roman Republic and part discussion of formations of governance and justice. At the time, the Romans were involved in several wars abroad. Caesar was conducting his cam campaigns in Gaul. And citizens were rioting, and by 49 BC, Caesar had famously crossed the Rubicon and become dictator for life in 44 BC. And so the story of the late Roman Republic is in essence a tragic one. The decay that Cicero consistently speaks of eventually led to its demise, and Augustus became emperor with complete control of the state. But obviously, the Roman Republic was organized in very different ways to um, our modern constitution and modern constitutional arrangements, but I think there are some lessons which we can learn about state decline and decay. The constitution was not a modern day document which was designed for purposes ours was, but it was formed part of a mixture of arrangements. And as decades wore on, the republic became equally vulnerable to corruption, to abuse of power, patronage, and the use of state resources for private gain and indeed to decline. Patronage and its consequences were nothing new in Cicero's world. Amicitia, or friendship between those in powers and others, was a mere institution, and what started out as being part of the fabric of Roman life quickly became sullied by corruption and abuse of the patron-client relationship. The nobility controlled the political institutions, and through them, their network of clients and friends, Amicitia became a weapon of politics, not a sentiment based on friendship. And Roman friendships then evolved as a web of expectation and obligation, a system which was ripe for abuse, and that was particularly useful during Rome's period of expansion abroad, and that created many opportunities for the misuse of patronage. Does any of that sound even vaguely familiar? So the lessons of Cicero's lament for the decline of the late Republic should not be lost on us. And 
and tracing South Africa's journey to democracy, we can find almost as many details before we arrived at 1994 in our negotiated settlement. It was flawed, but it brought with it civil and political rights, if not the economic emancipation we all had hoped for. And so Cicero's lament for the already fading colors of the Roman Republic may be our lament for the state of our democracy in the aftermath of the Zuma years. And so today we want to focus on how do we in this context renew the colors of our constitution and take care to preserve its configurations and its outlines. Ashil Mbembe, the Cameroonian political theorist whose seminal work on the post colony continues to define much of the debate around the characteristics of post-colonial Africa, calls this a negative moment in our history. But in a sense, the negative moment to me is a culmination of sorts, a culmination of the Zuma years that were marked by a lack of openness and transparency, by increased securitization of the state, and marked inequality, economic paralysis, intolerance, as well as the abuse of democratic institutions. And today, as we sit here, the economic state we are in is frankly a crisis. The numbers are well known to all of us. The latest numbers for the second quarter of this year show that over 6 million people are unemployed. This reflects an unemployment rate of 27.2% on the narrow definition of unemployment. On the expanded definition, which includes people who've given up looking for work, it comes to a staggering 37.2%. Let's take that in for a minute. Youth unemployment is the highest in sub-Saharan Africa at 52%. In addition, according to the latest Afrobarometer statistics, trust in politicians is low, not surprising. 62% of South Africans do not trust their politicians. Given the daily news of corruption and long-running state capture narrative, one shouldn't be surprised. 61% of South Africans do not trust local government. And this also appears to be expected because this tier of government appears perpetually overwhelmed by a combination of the scale of its responsibilities and the paucity of its capacity, and of course, by corruption. Deep scarring inequality and poor governance, mismanagement and corruption have all contributed to the lack of voice that many South Africans feel. In our constitution, voice is rendered as participatory democracy. This concept is a golden thread that runs through the constitution. It is the notion that we don't simply vote every five years, but that we have an ongoing relationship with our elected representatives, and that that is a continuing conversation. Sadly, though, the reality does not match the aspirations. And so South Africans have sought to find voice in different ways. We have a strong protest culture in our country, and sadly, more recently, protests have become part of the quotidian. Our country has much to which we're inured, that our activism often turns violent, limits the prospects, I believe, for us to change society. And so we must challenge each other at all times, I think, to find more constructive ways of voicing discontent. We saw the protests in Chwani in 2016 and how debilitating those were. And the Fees Must Fall protests reached their peak during that year too. They were very different protest actions, but what it did show was the, the way in which the ANC government had lost control of the discourse of the narrative and how disconnected it was from young people particularly in its core constituencies. But across the country, people talk of feeling as if they're watching a passing show and voice frustration at the obstacles to their participation in the economy of the country. Our social fabric also continues to fray as a result, and we know that this is a country that can break our hearts into a million pieces. The palpable violence of poverty and exclusion is experienced by our country's most vulnerable citizens as part of their daily life. But a few examples stand out. The 2014 death of five-year-old Michael Kamaki, who fell into a pepper tree and drowned in his own feces. And the life essay Domeni tragedy, which saw over 100 people die after the Gauteng Health Department moved them from existing care facilities. They show the neglect of the Zuma years of the state, alongside the Marikana massacre of mine workers by police in 2012. 
As James Kamabi, Michael's father, said, we did not send him to school to die. Where was the political leadership? Where was the politician's shame at what had happened? And where was their desire to make amends? Instead, the state fought back in the civil case against the most vulnerable of families and doubled their pain by continuing to defend itself in protracted litigation. These stories are heart-wrenching. The Life S.C. Domeni case shows the lack of care which manifests itself across our country daily. Enter almost any government building for an interaction with the state and we confront snaking queues of people with dead-eyed stares, most of them black and poor, standing for hours. Mostly the service is slow and indifferent. It shows a state that had become so arrogant and unmoored from its principles that it was prepared to deny the most vulnerable in our society their basic rights. And this form of violence, and there really is no other word for it, against the poor, creates even greater marginalization and exclusion. We are better than this. In recent weeks, we have experienced the drip-drip effect of the Zondo Commission. Some of it, I'm sure you'll all agree, has been particularly disappointing. This past week, we've seen Finance Minister Nflantlan Nene's dramatic exit as a result of it. But the positive is that we are shining a light in very dark places with crucial information about the Zuma years, the corruption, and perhaps before, the corruption prevalent in the machinations of various players. It has been sobering, to say the least. And it has prompted, I think, many of us as South Africans to look again at the power of the free media and the constitutional right to information. The question, of course, which now remains open, is whether or not there will be prosecutions once the Zondo Commission of Inquiry has done its work. That, in turn, will depend on who the next National Director of Public Prosecutions will be. And this, I would argue, is probably the most crucial appointment of the Ramaphosa presidency. One senses that he simply must get it right. As South Africans, though, we do tend to navel gaze, and I've sort of spent the first part of the speech navel gazing about the problems that we have. We seem to be preoccupied with our plight and with solving everything immediately. Yet the reality is that if we want to salvage our constitutional democracy, which I are, would argue is bruised and battered, but definitely still standing, then we do need to take the long view. This doesn't come easily in a world of quick fixes where 24-hour social media demands immediate solutions. Yet that is where we are at the moment, in a world with neither obvious heroes nor villains, but mostly shades of grey. We have to stay focused on the long when Sir Ramaphosa took office, he promised a new dawn. But of course, I think even he knew that this was going to be a really uphill battle. He has inherited a hot mess. I won't go into the details of all of this, but they're familiar to all of you in the audience. State and enterprise and state capture, SARS, and one could go on. And so no matter how many times Ramaphosa summons the better angels of our nature and encourages us to say, to Mamina, we all knew that it was going to be tough to rebuild our economy and a social compact which is dangerously fraying at the seams. At the 100-day mark of the presidency, the media and others were starting to feel the urge to somehow measure it. Our public discourse, and indeed discourse around the world, could do with that rare commodity, restraint. As we try to grapple with race, with issues of land, with the triple challenges of unemployment, poverty and inequality, how to change our public spaces and the nature of life along our highways and byways, we need to restrain ourselves from the immediacy of the quick fix. Somehow we need to seek ways to balance both affect and reason in the public debate. Easy slogans about decolonization, white monopoly capital, taking back the land, and white tears will only lead to the cul-de-sac of thought that we have seen thus far. Track the presidency we must. Hold the Ramaphosa presidency to account we must. But there is an urgent need to take the long view. And it may not satisfy the slogan for politics of populism, but it is necessary if we are going to think carefully about an inclusive democracy. The next struggle, I believe, is finding the Constitution again. One of the values of the Constitution is our next struggle. It is one which fits those 
will destroy the state for their own narrow gain, directly against those who seek to build a country where those in power are accountable and responsive to, to the citizenry. There are several challenges which remain as we seek to entrench rights and the supremacy of the Constitution, which seems to become an increasingly contested terrain. It's become fashionable to question the 1994 constitutional and negotiated settlement. And so I believe we need to go back to the beginning. For me, the starting point always is the Constitution. It represents the framework around which everything else pivots. And despite the criticism of the Constitution, by the ANC, a faction of the ANC, that fought for its adoption and was deeply involved in its writing process. To me, it remains the lone The aspirational document founded by the mothers intended. It has its faults, but in essence, it provides a framework to the policy of But also, all of us who need to demand the accountability from public representatives. And the question that is often asked is, tomorrow if the Constitution was scrapped, who would march in its defense? What would all of us in this room do? That we have strayed so far from the ideal, and that inequality has risen so dramatically, is not the fault of the Constitution. It has not failed us in providing the necessary space for transformation and the guidelines for a state which is accountable. In the unanimous judgment of the Constitutional Court in the Encanda matter, Chief Justice McQueen McQueen eloquently outlined what kind of state the Constitution envisages. He said, accountability, the rule of law, and the supremacy of the Constitution are crucial. He went to state how this applies to all public representatives, including the President. He says, for this reason, public office bearers ignore their constitutional obligations at their peril. This is so because constitutionalism, accountability, and the rule of law constitute the sharp and mighty sword that stands ready to chop the ugly head of impunity off its stiffened neck. And that's very vivid language by our Chief Justice, and we've become used to that. But it's a stark reminder of the promise of the Constitution and aspects which remain still unfulfilled. During the fees must fall protests and beyond, the argument against the Constitution was repeated. Somehow the Constitution has been scapegoated in this process. The arguments against the Constitution that I heard during that time went something like this. White people have had everything. Black people entered a compromise so whites could keep just about everything and hand black people scraps off the table. It's a sloppy analysis, not all untrue, that doesn't take into account the global and political context of the time sketched above and doesn't truly engage with many of the deeply progressive constitutional judgments which have been handed down since 1996. Yet it can be compelling in a populist way. Former Constitutional Judge, Court Judge Albie Sachs and Struggle Stalled offers a powerful counter-narrative, and I believe the counter-narratives are important. He tells of the internal debate within the ANC and, how the, and the principled leadership of O.R. Tambo supporting the concept of the Bill of Rights when the moment arose. Tambo was set upon constitutionalizing aspects of the struggle, and in Sachs's words, learning from every source and widening the embrace of the ANC as a movement and in its thinking. Tambo's and the ANC's strategic position on the Bill of Rights was that it would exist to quote unquote protect everyone, black and white, rich and poor, in Sachs's words. The constitution itself was needed as protection against arbitrariness by all leaders and indeed, as Sachs said, to be used against ourselves. That was in 1988. Admittedly, it's often difficult to hear people like Sachs and their reasonable above the no reasonableness above the noise of now. So the Constitution might not provide all of the answers, but it does provide us with the guide. And it would be a pity then if in questioning and having a debate about the content and outcome of our negotiated settlement, if the Constitution becomes collateral damage. 
it is crucial to understand how we arrived at the Constitution and why it is at the bedrock of our society. What is often forgotten is the road we have traveled and the respect we need to have for those early and difficult decisions that Nelson Mandela in particular and other members of the ANC had to make as South Africa stared down the edge of the abyss. And so this difficult political and social moment that we're in requires measured interventions from leaders across society if we are to change the status quo and achieve dignity for all. And so in the midst of these arguments sometimes, our dialogue becomes confused. Sometimes even violence, burning, and the calls for everything to fall. Yet if something falls, what rises in its place? And if things burn, who will rebuild? So given the challenges of the present, where exactly should our focus lie in fashioning this post-Zuma democracy? A democracy in which, and this was a working definition of democracy that we always used when I worked at the Institute for Democracy in South Africa. A democracy in which, where, a country in which we enable citizens to build popular, accountable, and sustainable self-government and enjoy equality with each other in governance processes. Our society now, more than ever, is in need of critical voices on every front as it continues the battle to find its soul. And how do we forge a society which raises leaders who are capable of what Njibula and Debele once called counterintuitive leadership? This, I would argue, takes us beyond the ANC and President Ramaphosa and any other political party. It is reimagining a quite different South Africa. And there are a number of areas that I believe we should be focusing on if we are to create a sustainable democracy and take advantage of this window of opportunity that I believe we have. In many ways, we are finding our collective voice again. The one thing that I believe Ahmed Kathrada would not have wanted was for us to throw our hands up in despair and give up. I would argue also that it's not who we are as a people. If my work at Adasa and elsewhere on democracy building has shown anything, it is that democracy is a journey, not an event, marathon, not sprint. But there's some key ingredients that we need to have. The first is education, education, education. And clearly, post apartheid South Africa's greatest failure has been our education system, despite the fact that we have spent more on education as a proportion of GDP than in other areas. Too many South African children simply drop out of school before reaching matric. And the annual puff and pose surrounding the matric pass rate is just that, puff, when only 28% of those who pass are able to reach university, not to mention the number of young children who drop out and never see matric. Education is a means of lifting people out of poverty and providing a way out of desperate situations. But in a post-1994 country based on a flawed notion of empowerment, education often takes a back seat in our national discourse, which prizes crass wealth accumulation about the emancipatory power of a decent education. Our post-94 world has been littered with politicians driving German SUVs and a form of empowerment which is not preferred skill or education, but instead is preferred political proximity. President Zuma mocked clever blacks and seemed comfortable with his ignorance. We will also need further investment and serious commitment to proper intellectual pursuit. Education and knowledge must be the cornerstone of any society seeking to build a culture of democracy. It means we need teachers in the classroom. It means greater accountability with regard to that. Better infrastructure, proper leadership, principals who can lead. It means that the issues around corruption within the South African Democratic Teachers Union, the buying of posts, which remains unresolved, needs to be resolved. But we also need to focus on enhancing skills, vocational training, FET colleges, and empowering young women to enter universities and focus on language, math, science. The diagnosis has been done over and over again, but we need to make this happen. Constitutional education, I believe, is a very important part of this. What is the Constitution? What is its purpose? How does it provide the checks and balances on power and give rise to a culture of accountability on top of fine words and institutions? 
What is chapter two of the Bill? Of what, what is chapter two of the Constitution? What does it mean when we say socioeconomic rights are justiciable? And what were the cases brought before the court which protected the vulnerable? The culture of accountability, that there are consequences for actions, can only happen in a society where there is knowledge of the Constitution and where citizens demand it. It demands us to have respect for those in authority, but not deference, not deference to power. There's been too much of that, I think, in the post 94 South Africa, from seemingly trivial issues like ministers arriving late for functions to the dire recent behavior of ministers like Vasubila, Ghanini, and Lucy Gaga. Surely, unfit for office and must go. Our memories of Zoom and laughing it off are still fresh and raw. And then the economy. Um, it is about the economy, stupid, and it has to be fixed. We need to, though, start creating trust between economic players based on an understanding that a fair wage, a proper skills base, artisanship, and entrepreneurship has to be supported. Some form of shared sacrifice is necessary to deal with the ravages of the past. Some have been calling for an economic cadessa to deal with unemployment, poverty, and inequality. Perhaps that is something that we might pursue, who knows? According to the World Bank report released in April and discussed in South Africa, we are the most un um, unequal society in the world. The Ramaphosa presidency has been trying to, to deal with the economy uh, through the job summit, through looking at the um, institutions on a, in a big picture manner, and also through the Youth Employment Service Program, which looks at addressing youth unemployment and encouraging and supporting entrepreneurship. This is Anna, director of the Graduate School of Development Policy and Practice at UCT, reminds us. Getting to serious, inclusive economic growth is going to demand a great deal of work by skilled policy makers working within effective social partnership agreements. Hirsch goes on to say that policy certainty is needed about mining, land, and black economic empowerment to encourage new investment. Small business is also crucial as a cog in the wheel of the economy. Much of the red tape surrounding small business creation will have to be cut and the Ministry of Small Business Development needs to be more efficient in spending what money is allocated to it. In 2017, Minister Lindiwe Zulu failed to spend 140 million of her grant in her budget, while simultaneously asking for a bigger one. Needless to say, education and understanding is crucial to building a functional and thriving economy. However, it will take a long term. a light on the dark, in the dark places and much of what we're hearing is Flywell Travel presents September school holiday packages. Enjoy this mini break at ridiculous prices. Depart on the 24th of September, six nights in Medina and five nights in Mecca. Prices from as little as 9,500 Rand per person. Inclusive of FA, accommodation and Umrah visa for first time Mutamirin. Contact Flywell Travel on 86 10786 or visit our website www.flywell.co.za <laughs> Bring 
your whole family and make your life so much easier with One Up Cash and Carry, where you get more for less and excellent customer service at its best. Remember, wholesale prices straight to the public. One Up Cash and Carry, where you get more for less. More for less. Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah Akbar 